Today, I'm delighted to have Claire Anderson, MP for Putney and a Shadow Cabinet Office Minister. Thank you so much for, for coming to talk about ME and to part of Millie's Missing this year. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. It's really important. So I'm really glad to be part of it. Can you tell me how you got involved in supporting people with ME? Some residents in Putney contacted me about their experience of having ME. Um, so Ruth and Zoe, and I've been in contact with them quite a lot. So I've learned a lot about what it is like for them to have the disease and also found out how hard it is to speak out and what an invisible illness and frustrating it is. So I want to be able to speak up for them and for people like them across the country. And what struck you most about the challenges faced by this group? I think, first of all, that it's a very misunderstood illness um, and very invisible as well. So lots of people who have it feel that they are not understood when they go and talk to their GP or their employer or at school to their teachers. And how frustrating that must be to feel at, on the one hand, you've got this, what it's been described to me as very devastating and debilitating illness, having a huge effect on your life. And on the other hand, that it's not being understood or accepted as such. Um, so also the, the difference that people find in different parts of the country about how they're understood and therefore the support that they get as well. So that it's so unfair, so unfair to get this illness uh, and to be so affected for it, but also so unfair to have a different response depending on where you are in the country. So what is the most important action that you and other MPs can take? Well, I think the fact that it's misunderstood and not taken seriously, that's something that we can challenge um, in, in our role as leaders uh, in the country. I think that's something that we can speak out about um, and make sure that we challenge that taboo really and challenge it when, uh, when there are comments that are made wrongly um, and there's a misdiag places where it's misdiagnosed or not taken seriously enough. But also there's the whole area of research um, and the need for more biomedical research. So I think pushing for that research to happen. I mean, there's so many questions about diagnosis, how it's being diagnosed, but also treatment, um, and then really, really tackling this. I would love to see some huge breakthroughs being made. Um, we can't do that without enough research. So I think MPs calling for that research um, is something else that I can do as well. That would be very valuable and hugely appreciated if that could happen. And what, following on, what are your views on the impact of COVID and long COVID on the treatment of people with ME? It's really interesting how more people are now talking about understanding um, what it's like to be under lockdown. So um, Ruth and Zoe in my constituency, they've said equivalently, we've we've been under lockdown for years. We felt we've been in lockdown, Zoe said, since 2014. And so there's an understanding of, um, I think, the, the impact that that has on your life and how isolating it is. And there's an opportunity there as well. So there's a lot more, um, uh, there's a lot more people being affected by a similar disease. There's a lot more um, potentially links between the two. So what, what are the links between long COVID and the susceptibility of having um, ME or CFS as, as there was with flu as well. So there was much more likelihood of, of having ME if you have flu. So there, what are the links then? So there's a need for understanding. There's also more money there available potentially for that research which is needed. There are these long COVID centres that have been set up. Nothing like that's been set up for people with ME, but there it is. And so I hope that this is an opportunity that, that the two can be seen together and an understanding um, together of, of what they are. But also there's potentially um, a danger that it'll be misunderstood and it'll be just dismissed again and that people who have long COVID will have the same experiences that people with ME have had and that we can't have that happening. So we should learn from what's happened. We should learn that you can't be saying it's all in your mind or just push on through or you know the wrong kind of treatment might be given. Those links are being made. I've seen in debates, for example, on long COVID in the House of Commons. Um, and so there's an opportunity to, to look into this, to get that research that we've been needing all the time. And we need it even more than ever because so many people are affected um, with long COVID. My cousin, for example, he got long COVID last March. He's still facing absolutely devastating impact of that in so many different ways. We can't, we can't let this, um, this happen in the same way that it's just 
strung on and on without very much resolution or action from the government um, with ME. Can't let that happen for, for all those people who have ME and who have long COVID. Drawing on your campaigning experience, both before you entered Parliament and since you were elected, how do you think people, both within and, with, and outside the ME community, can affect positive change? I know it must feel like for many people that they battle on with the system. So I can understand the feeling of why should I write to my MP? What difference will it make? Um, would I use some of my precious energy on doing that? But I would encourage people that it does make a difference. So those constituents who've written to me, it's really re made a big impact on me and made me as an MP think about what I can do. Um, it's important for it not to be such an invisible disease. Um, and so by writing to your MP and asking them to speak out, you're able to make, make your, your experience known, um, but also for someone else to then take up the cause on your behalf as well, which is really important. So I would encourage people, I know it's exhausting, um, to, to battle on, to write to their MP. And things like, I can't get a blue badge, um, let your MP know about that. Um, so it's an experience I'm looking into and saying, asking those questions. Why, why can't you? What, it, what could be changed? Is it something at a council level? Is it national um, that could be changed about that? So, so some of your, the experiences that people are having, please do share them, do make them known. And that's why I'm really glad to be supporting the Millions Missing campaign as well, because that is so important um, where people can't be out in public life. Um, I can be that person in public life speaking up, and I'm sure other MPs would be able to as well. And every MP and Ali who supports people with ME is, is so hugely appreciated. So thank you. And finally, what words of encouragement would you give to people with ME now? Well, I think that link with long COVID is, is an encouraging one as well. And I think that should lead to much more understanding of, um, of the symptoms, of, of understanding in, in uh, just in normal life about how to cope with those, um, about understanding from GPs um, that, that it won't be such an invisible and misunderstood illness. And also um, that money for research. Um, there are there's research going on Leicester University Oxford Newcastle UCL there are some areas of research looking into diagnosis into um, treatment so there, there is the beginning of research um, and I will certainly be pushing for more so there are signs of hope um, and just so just being more organized together as well I, I can see the result of that about people getting together and speaking up together it does get noticed um, it is making an, a, a difference um, and I think um, we should we should see we should see hope in that um, and changes for the future as well. My name is Louise from ME Action. I'm talking to Alex Chalk, MP for Cheltenham, Gloucestershire, missing. Hi, Alex. Thank you for taking the time to talk to me for this year's Virtual Millions Missing. Can you tell me how you first got involved with supporting people with METFS? Yes, I can. And uh, can, can I first of all thank you very much for inviting me to say a, a few words on this. And um, this is something, uh, this is a, a cause which I've been interested in for many, many years. And my experience had been of um, seeing friends who had been affected by this, point one. But point two, seeing how there was this overwhelming sense that people who were struck down by this condition, people who had gone from being outward going, so outgoing, fun, vivacious, uh, successful, vigorous people laid low. That was the first part that was tough. But the second bit is them basically not being believed, putting it bluntly. And there was a sense in which they people were being diminished, uh, patronized, even sometimes by some parts of the medical fraternity, although I think that's changed very much now. And I was just determined that I should try to use the platform of being in politics to be a voice for people who all too often were marginalized. So I was determined to do that at a time when it, it was deeply unfashionable. Let me tell you, taking up this course was deeply unfashionable, but I wanted, I wanted to do so and to speak out for those, for this condition, which, which seems to be get less airtime and has less, I think I said in the past, has less sort of it's kind of less media friendly than perhaps other things which celebrities jump on 
And so I was, I was keen to do so. So the short answer to your question, I've been involved for since I was elected in 2015, and that builds on a, on a really a, a lifelong concern and interest for sufferers from these conditions. What challenges do you think we face? Well, do you know what? It, it is, there is a crowded compassion minefield out there. You know, MPs will be bombarded on issues ranging from you know, multiple sclerosis to cancer, of course, which is always so visible and, and has affected so many people. So the challenges are how in that very crowded um, space do we get the voice of MECFS sufferers heard? I think we've We've established a beachhead, if you like. So previously, we were sort of floundering in the sea, trying to trying to get a beachhead, uh, and I think we've got that beachhead. But we have to carry on with our campaign, and and to to kill the metaphor, <laughs> we have to scale the scale the cliffs. And um, so that's the first thing: is is being vocal and loud and proud for uh, for people who suffer from a condition which doesn't always enjoy the same PR advantages. Point one. And point two, what we need to do is make sure we're not shouting in an, into an empty room. In other words, we have to target and direct our advocacy towards those people who can make a difference. In practical terms, that means, as I've, I've done and, and I know others have as well, speaking directly to the health secretary, Matt Hancock, who I know is interested in this, to try to carve out funding. I, I don't know if you remember, for example, Tessa Jowell, that really wonderful woman and a great advocate for people who suffer from brain cancer. There was a, following the outpouring of grief at her death, there was a, a lot of money that was allocated towards brain cancer research. What we have to do is to ensure that we are directing our campaigning firepower to those people who can unlock that kind of support, as we've seen incidentally, um, but how, so we can unlock a long and sustainable pipeline of support for the future. You spoke very eloquently on our behalf in the debate in Westminster Hall in June 2018. And I was just wondering if you wanted to talk a little bit about that. Well, in 2018, there was this overwhelming sense that we in Parliament, from all parties incidentally, who had been affected in some way through our friends, that we wanted to give a voice to the voiceless, good people who are suffering through no fault of their own, who have been laid low, whose um, often careers have been cut short to, to, to do so. So it was talking about uh, an injury whose PR, well, sorry, a disease whose PR has been terrible. That was the point that I was basically making, that we needed to turn this uh, around. And then the second thing, as I, I, I indicated before, the key was to, to get uh, government to ensure that more funding went into research. And I think we've managed to achieve some. We want more. We, we certainly managed to make a, a difference there. But the third thing also was to ensure some of these um, old, outdated ideas about how you go about treating ME. And we all know about graded exercise therapy and how some people could be um, led to uh, uh, um, treatments which actually made the situation worse. So we wanted to revisit all those things uh, and to ensure people who had real life experience of what it meant to live with this condition were absolutely at the forefront when it came to designing modern uh, treatments for this condition. How do you think people both within and outside the ME community can help affect positive change? Well, look, I think people like you and, and others in Cheltenham have done absolutely the right thing, which is basically in a dignified but determined way, lobby the key lobbyists. What I mean by that is go after the people who can amplify and articulate your cause. That means very often going after your member of parliament, but it may not be exclusively your member of parliament. It may be that there are other opinion formers either in the press or, you know, celebs or goodness knows what but lobby the lobbyists would be my strong um, advice and so um i i think that particularly now as we move past the pandemic and we recognize that there are an awful lot of people who've got long covid i think there is an opportunity for us to accelerate our advocacy in this regard so as here in gloucestershire the local ccg is setting up long covid clinics well can we make sure that the learning that comes from that isn't lost when it comes to the treatment of those with ME-CFS. No one's suggesting for a second that they are identical, but it stands to reason, you might think, 
that there are some crossovers that we ought to not lose sight of. So my encouragement to the, to the local, um, well, to the, all ME and CFS sufferers is uh, take, give yourself a pat on the back for how far you've come in the last five years, but there is now an opportunity to go further and faster. So let's take that opportunity, make sure you lobby the lobbyists, your MPs, your other local opinion formers, and ensure that the right people in Westminster, the Matt Hancocks, the Boris Johnsons and so on, get to hear your uh, case. I will certainly be doing everything I, I properly can to do so. Lastly, what words of encouragement, and you've given us lots already, but what words of encouragement do you want to give the millions missing for 2021? My strong message, the millions missing, is I don't think you're missing anymore. You're moving out of the shadows. There is further to come. But having been in on a dark periphery, you're now moving into the light. And I think we have to take this opportunity to ensure that the greater focus that there now is on those people who are suffering from long-term conditions like long COVID, we have to make sure that this uh, opportunity to improve the health, the treatment, the esteem and the respect for ME sufferers is not missed. And I think that there is a growing band of people in Parliament and beyond who are keen to continue and to sustain and to accelerate that campaign. So uh, my message is one of support and encouragement and to say that I think the best days for treatment of ME are, are, are ahead and I'm confident about that. So hello and welcome and um, today we have with the Scottish National Party for Glasgow North West MP Carol Monaghan. Uh, Carol has led the campaign in the UK Parliament to change attitudes towards ME and called for increased research funding and effective treatments for people with ME. Leading two Westminster Hall debates in 2018, a full debate in the House of Commons in 2019, also Deputy Chair of Forward ME. Um, Carol is Chair of the Westminster All Party Parliamentary Group on ME, a group that she has re established in January 2020. Carol has supported millions missing through speaking at events um, and the Action Scotland held in Edinburgh and Glasgow and participated in the virtual event last year. Many thanks to you, Carol, for all that you do to support people with ME. I'd like to begin by asking you, how did you get involved with campaigning for people with ME? Thanks very much. And, and first of all, thanks for the opportunity to speak to you today. Um, I think, I mean, I've, I've spoken about this many times and I knew very little about ME. And it was actually when I was first campaigning to be elected before I was even an MP that somebody spoke to me or contacted me and said, would I come to their house and, and visit them? And I went there and we had a nice chat. I made tea and biscuits and things. And then she said, what I wanted to ask you was, what does a person with disabilities look like? At that point, she says, well, actually, I've got ME. Um, what do you know about that? And I had to say, absolutely nothing. It makes you tired. <laughs> um, so that was sort of the start of it. Um, and I think that's really important that people in the ME community do engage with, with those in positions of responsibility because um, many people don't understand the implications. They don't know anything about what living with ME means. And, and it's not through a reluctance to find out. It is just because it's never been presented to them. So I think I, I think that's a really important point is about engagement and a, engagement with elected representatives. So that was how my journey started. You've touched on this briefly, but how have you addressed the challenges um, people with ME face? I think one of, one of the biggest issues for for the ME community is that they are very much a hidden community and because of the nature of the condition it's very difficult to be out and about campaigning been loud and, and, and proud and all of these things so it's, it is very difficult so they do need people to be advocates for them so I think one of the things I've tried to do through my work in parliament is simply to raise awareness to get other MPs on board, to get people talking about the issues that people with MEs um, face. But we've looked at issues, uh, more detailed issues around, for example, um, inappropriate treatment or complete lack of treatment for, for people with ME, um, the feelings of social isolation, the inability to 
um, tap into, I suppose, support, financial support that should be there available for them. So we've, we've kind of raised these issues, but I've also had meetings with, for example, disabilities minister, and we had um, we met with those that carry out healthcare assessments to look at how is someone treated when they present with ME because they might present looking fabulous, beautifully dressed, lovely makeup on, hair done, looking smart, and so the assessors look at them and think, yeah, nothing wrong with you, and we have to get over that. So, so having these discussions with those that are doing the assessments and saying. This is not the, the, the physical appearance is not a representation of how the condition impacts a person's life and the person's ability to carry out work in many cases. So, so these these meetings have been really important as well. Um, other things that we've done, and this is part of the APPG. Last year, in, in, with the group, we took evidence that was looking at how children with ME in particular were treated. And um, there were some really disturbing uh, testimonies given to us about how um, social services became involved, how child protection proceedings were started against some children. So we wrote to um, we wrote to a governments across the UK, all the devolved governments and the, the UK government um, as well, to try and highlight these and to get some sort of clear points of you know what, what would happen if a child presented in this way and how could they ensure that there would be proper um, notice taken of the condition they were living with. So we've been doing lots lots of things around lots of things around that but clearly there's a um, has the day-to-day -day experience of someone with ME changed significantly over the last few years? I don't think it really has. And if that's the case, then there's a huge amount of work still to be done. And the youth within us, you know, the, the adolescents that are suffering with ME, they get lost in the system, you know, when it's not recognised. I think for, for young people with ME in particular, if you think about how important these years sort of between, between the ages of probably 10, 11, 12, up to about 30. These are really formative years. These are really years where you make lifelong friendships and develop relationships and find out the person you really are. And if that time, those really important years are kind of scarred with trying to have been isolated, been trying to deal with something, and, and some, in many cases, dealing with much worse if you aren't able to access education or you have social service involvement is it, it, it we have a fundamental problem there that we need to be looking at so for these young people in particular i think we, it, there's really a duty in all of us to make sure that we get this right my third question carol is thinking about the future what are your priorities for me again you have briefly touched on this but if there's anything in, sp in particular and specifically what would you say your priorities for people with me are i think I mean, I've already said awareness raising, and that has to remain a priority. And that has to, to for any MPs who are involved, that has to be key. Um, because the more we talk about it, the more we realise what the issues are and what it, what we need to do. So the new NICE guidelines are um, are giving hope to the ME community. Uh, it's it's great to see the removal of graded exercise therapy in the draft guidelines, but it would be quite worrying, and I think we need to watch this very carefully and make sure that we don't see a creep back in of graded exercise into, into the, the guidelines. So I know that developing these draft guidelines, patients were listened to, and that was that was so important when, when these were being drawn up. Um, to have that patient voice as part of, of um, as, as part of the response to this. Thinking about the future, what are your priorities for people with ME? Short term, we need to uh, ensure that the draft NICE guidelines, which are looking pretty good, I think they've been they've been received pretty well by the ME community. I think we would just be um, have to be cautious that these make it into a final. Um, nice guidelines so um so i think that's that's sort of the initial um 
sort of aim. Probably also need to look at the promotion of these new guidelines um, to make sure that they are properly implemented in, in different health boards as well. Some of the, the issues we know that have arisen are to do with um, healthcare professionals not being fully up to date to, with developments in, in um, sort of ME research. So I think we need to, there has to be some sort of uh, promoting of, of the new NICE guidelines to make sure that people are, are fully aware of what is required. Longer term, I mean, we've got the same same goals, pretty much longer term. We need better um, diagnosis and treatment for those with a ME. We need people, people need help in terms of managing their condition. And we have to raise awareness, so not just amongst healthcare professionals, but other people as well. DWP health assessors um, and other people that might come into contact. Um, we've had a lot of information about the experience of young people, children and young people with ME when we consider their schooling. So, so I think there's there's tons of work still to be done. So I don't think I don't think we'll be able to leave any of this quite yet. So a lot of work to be done still. Fourth question is, what are your views on the impact that COVID and long COVID could have on the treatment of people with ME? Yeah, I mean, it, long COVID probably, it, it, it's, um, will be something that is pretty bad for those that are, are experiencing it. But of course, those with ME recognise many of the, the symptoms that those with long COVID are experiencing. Um, I think there's been there's been some sort of, some people have welcomed the situation, not necessarily the experience of those with long COVID, but um, have welcomed the, the recognition of this condition. Um, because for, for many people with ME who recognise a lot of the symptoms, to see this as another presenting as a, a quite a similar condition will actually allow them to, um, will allow certainly healthcare professionals and others to, to have more knowledge of uh, the realities of those living with ME and other post-viral conditions. So I think there, is, there are some positives in terms of um, the recognition and, and hopefully the treatment. Um, it's interesting because some people with long COVID are actually getting help from ME treatment centres just now because that's where some, the experience can lie. Um, I think there is potential here because the government is very much aware that there is a large body of people that are experiencing these symptoms that have kind of developed over the previous 12 months. So I think there is, there is certainly move amongst politicians to see can we, can we improve services for those with long COVID and of course any improvement for services for those with long COVID will of course make a difference. Um, I believe, to the, um, the services that are available for people with ME as well. I think um, the ME community should, um, should actually congratulate themselves on the work that they have done because um, the information, particularly around uh, um, things like, for example, graded exercise and pacing has been extremely helpful for those with long COVID. So the fact that all of that work has already been done has really helped this new community of people that are suffering from post-viral conditions. Our fifth question, Carol, is how do you think people, both within and outside the ME community, can help affect positive change? Um, for example, would you encourage people to contact their MP or their M MSP to raise awareness? There are so many things that people can do within the, um, the ME community, but, but definitely in, contact your elected representatives. It's really important. We are here. Use us, but, but don't expect MPs or MSPs or your local councillors to have any knowledge or experience. Some will, but some many won't. Um, they wouldn't have that, that sort of experience of what it is like to, to be living with ME. So if you're contacting them, it's important that you detail how it impacts your day-to-day -day life and the, the help that you want, them, uh, want from them. Now, 
often say this to people, when you contact an elected representative, make sure you've written it down beforehand, especially, you, we know people with ME can um, experience brain fog, um, and it, it can be it can be quite quite a strain to actually have a meeting with an elected representative. So make sure you've written it down, you've bullet pointed it. If you're not up to a physical or a face-to-face -face by Zoom or something, if you're not up to that, make sure you email with the points. But importantly, you must include things that you want them to do. There's no point in just saying, this is terrible and this is my experience and how are you going to help? They might not know how to help, so detail them, tell them exactly what it is that you want them to do. I need more ME clinics, for example, we need more ME clinics in this, we need more money spent in biomedical research, we need more support networks in place for young people and children with ME that allows them to access education. And I want you to write to a minister about this or ask this question in Parliament. So make sure it's not just a list of the issues, but also a list of action that you wish your elected representative to take. But absolutely, it's it's by contacting people like me that you actually um, can feed into to the legislative process, process. So make sure you do it. Our sixth question is, what words of encouragement do you want to give the millions missing from 2021? So this is our final question, Carla. I mean, um, obviously it's here <laughs> again, another, another May and another and people still feeling really frustrated that there's not been major changes, but I actually think there are changes happening. And, and I think it's a testament to the work that's been done by people like ME Action and other organisations that are managing to, to empower people and get people sort of um, asking for, or, or asking together um, lobbying government, lobbying others to make things happen. So I think there's got to be, you've got to take real sort of encouragement and pride from what has been done. We've seen the draft NICE guidelines. These are significantly improved from the previous. We now see the, the decode ME genetic study been taking place. This is really important as well. And we're now starting to talk about proper treatment um, for are, are help with managing ME. So I think there is there is huge progress has been made. Clearly, we have miles still to go. But I think um, just I want to pass on just words both of encouragement and just congratulations for everybody involved because I think we we are seeing massive changes and um, and everyone has to be. We've got to celebrate what we are seeing and celebrate the positive aspects of this.